not him. <laughs> the adversary. That's what the word means. He's our adversary. And when we read this passage, there's some things I just want to bring forth. You know, how do we, anybody here ever get tempted by the devil? <laughs> of course. If you ain't never been tempted by the devil, you can come up and preach. <laughs> and, and what did Jesus, I, I believe that this first, this first act, this, this first act of his ministry, he could have went out and started healing sick people and raising dead people and all that, but instead he went to a place all by himself. He had a one-on-one -on -one with Satan. He was going to be tempted. And that, that word tempt here, it, it means it, this was a testing. Now, Jesus didn't have to prove anything to God about who he was. Because God knew he was. He'd been with him for all of eternity. And Jesus didn't have to prove anything to himself. And he really didn't have to prove anything to the devil. But I believe that Jesus wanted us to see that just as he was able to withstand temptation, we're able to withstand temptation. And he didn't do it in, in a, in, from a position of strength. He did it from a position of weakness. And what did he use? Now, this is the same, this Jesus is the same God that at one time kicked Satan out of heaven. Put him out. But now, he has emptied himself into a form of a man. And he's putting himself in a place of weakness. Fasting. Fasting will make you weak, physically. He, had, he took away every weapon that he could possibly have had. But what did he use to resist the devil? When we, when we go through this passage, he used what? The word of God. And the same word that he has is the same word that we have. And these words that he's, that he's going to be quoting here, and most of us know this story, but they're taken from the book of Deuteronomy. All these quotes in here are taken from the book of Deuteronomy. It's the fifth book of the Old Testament. It was like the re-giving of the law. If you know anything about Deuteronomy, or if you did any studying in there, the key verse in Deuteronomy is probably Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Jesus quoted that. When, they, when, when somebody asked him what the greatest commandment was, he said, that's it. That's it. And he said, and he says, you should love your neighbor as yourself. So when Jesus, here's Jesus in the wilderness, and he's fasting, and he's in a place of weakness. And along comes the enemy to tempt him. And again, before we, before we read this passage, I, I want you to read one, more, one little passage with me. Because this really is Jesus, just as he said he had to be baptized for all righteousness' sake. He had to be baptized to relate to mankind. So he had to be tempted like we're tempted. And, and over all the way back, just, just a couple verses in 1 John. I want you to read something with me. Uh, and that's like way in the back. Okay. <laughs> In chapter 2, and, and in verse 15, I want, I want you to read this because we want to relate this. The same battle Jesus had in the wilderness is the same battle we have every day. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, he says this. Love not the world. You see that? Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, when he's talking about the world, he's not talking about nature. He's not talking about the beautiful, you know, that's not what he's talking. He's talking about all the stuff that we think are important. You know, last week, Rose and I went to a retreat, a minister's retreat. And they had it at Nemecolon Woodlands. You ever hear of Nemecolon Woodlands? Now, they got like a special deal because that's why we had to go in January because if you do it any other time, it would cost a ton of money. But 
you know, they got a special deal because there was a lot of us. But you go in this place and, and, and you walk through it, and it's, it's like the word is opulence. They got artwork. One of them pictures is probably worth more than my house. Okay. I mean, you know. And, and they have, they have uh, the, all the rooms have like chandeliers in them. And I don't mean they ain't Kmart chandeliers either. They're <laughs> and uh, they, uh, and the food, they have a restaurant there that we didn't eat in that restaurant. We, we, we had like a, like a catered thing. But they had a restaurant and they had like a menu out there. Man, it was like 250 bucks a person. I mean, this is a place for like Mario Lemieux, you know. I mean, this is, this is a place for like people with lots of money. And we were walking through this place. And it was nice, you know, and the people were nice. And they had, they took your baggage for you and everything. This wasn't like a Motel 6, you know. This was a, a great place. But Rose and I were saying, as we were walking through there, we were looking at each other and we said, we don't, we don't feel like we belong here. You know, because what the world thinks is important, you know, works of art and if you're not careful, you'd fall in love with that stuff. It ain't nothing wrong with decorating, right? Please don't misunderstand me. I don't, I'm not like some of them folks, you know, think you ought to live in a cardboard box. I'm not saying that. But, but it, it, you just get what I'm saying. I mean, so much, it's, it's, it, the word is opulent. And it's nice. It's nice. It's nice there. It was a nice place. But to me, it seemed like it was almost like a, a temple to the things of the world. And I'm not putting down wealthy people. Please don't misunderstand. I'm, I'm just saying that's just the way we felt when we were there. I'm kind of hoping next time they have it like in the Hampton somewhere. But, but, but it says, but listen to, what he, listen to what John says. For all that is in the world, now here it is. It's not, it's not so much stuff, okay? But all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God abides forever. Now, keep in those, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, okay? Back to Matthew with me, okay? But as we're going to see that Satan used the same thing with Jesus that he uses with us. It's nothing new. And, you know, I'm convinced of this, and maybe, you know, you might disagree with me. But we know that Satan knows his end, what this word says. I believe he knows what this word says about his end. But you know what? I think he believes he can still win. I believe he thinks he can still win. If he was stupid enough to think at the beginning, I believe he's, he thinks there's still a chance that he can, he can change this. And he does everything he can to try. So here we see Jesus in the wilderness. It says, verse 2, When he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered, as he would be. And when the tempter came to him, he said, and he begins his temptations. And I, I, I don't believe, again, when you read this, it seems as though Satan came like at the end of the 40 days. But I think he was there for the whole 40 days. I think this temptation just went on. That's just the way I read it. That's the way I see it. This temptation was just like a constant bombardment. And the three things we read here are, are indicative of the temptation. But listen to what he says. The tempter came to him, and the first thing he said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Now, he knew he was hungry. Nothing wrong with eating. I use that excuse all the time. <laughs> Nothing. But nothing wrong with eating. He was fasting. He was praying. And the, but there was nothing wrong with eating. So he said, you're hungry. Well, you're the son of God. Click your fingers, man. You can, hey, if you spoke the world into existence, you can give yourself a loaf of bread. Okay? Because he knew he was hungry. The temptation to the lust of the flesh. Hunger. Natural, fleshly desires. We all have them. And they make a whole lot of money off of them. <laughs> they do. They sell a lot of stuff. He says, he tempted Jesus to fulfill his hunger, but not as a man. You see, I can't click my fingers and turn a stone into a loaf of bread. Humans can't do that. Jesus became a man like you or I. He set aside 
the prerogatives of his deity. He didn't stop being God. But he chose, it says in Philippians, he made himself, poured himself into the form of a servant. So if he would have snapped his fingers and turned the stones to bread, he would have negated his, his mission on this earth. So what did Jesus do? He answered with the word of God. And again, he quotes from Deuteronomy. He says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, where he's speaking to the nation of Israel. And there it says this, And he humbled you, he's speaking to the nation of Israel, and suffered you to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man does not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. What God was doing, when God gave them manna in the wilderness, he gave them this stuff that was absolutely everything they needed to keep them nourished. Now they got tired of it after about 40 years. Because it was the same thing every day. But that's what they had to eat. When they would complain, and there were lots of times they complained about eating man. He sent them, he sent them quail one time, and, and another time he sent them so many quail it was coming out of their nostrils. And, I mean, but, but what, what Jesus, when he was talking about manna in John chapter 6, he said, I'm the bread of life. Listen, it's important that we have the things that we need for our daily, our daily needs. But... What we need more than anything is this Word of God. Because when Satan comes against you in your weakness, there's nothing that's going to make him run like the Word of God. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of, uh, out of the mouth of God. If we could just make that our... I hate to use the word mantra because that reflects on something different. But if we could make that our meditation, if we could make that our theme... I need the Word of God. That's why God help us if we ever quit preaching out of God's Word. You know, I, always, I, I can't imagine preaching out of anything else. If God's Word's enough. I don't, need, I don't need all these books they write. They help sometimes. It's okay to read other things. But it better agree with this. There's a whole lot of stuff getting written that doesn't agree with this. You better make sure it agrees with this. So Satan appealed to the lust of his flesh. He said, you're hungry? Snap your fingers, bread. Jesus said no. He says, what's more important than human bread? I could do that, but I would be negating my mission here. I can't, I've, I've made myself a servant. I've made myself a man. I can't feed myself like that. I can't just use my power just to satisfy my own flesh. I came here for another purpose. I came here to die for the sins of mankind. It says in verse 5, that the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, If you be the Son of God, cast yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge concerning the Satan's quote in the Scripture. He didn't just imagine that. <laughs> he didn't quote it quite right. If you read that passage from the Psalms, it's, he left a couple words out. But he said, go ahead, put a show on. He said, he quotes the scripture, he says, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou should dash thy foot against the stone. Go ahead, Jesus, show everybody how powerful you are. Get up to the top of the temple and jump off. And certainly God's not going to let you, your father's not going to let you die. So, just... You know, and everybody will see you, and they'll believe, right? You know, they didn't believe the miracles he did do, ultimately. Jesus didn't come to put a show on. We've said this before. We just celebrated Christmas. He didn't come as a superman. If he would have come as a superman, he might have he awed, and people would have been awestruck by him, but they wouldn't have believed in him. They'd just been afraid of him. So Jesus, again, refers to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. 
He says, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And it's interesting here that Jesus did not have a copy of the Bible with him. <laughs> I mean, he is the word. He wrote it. He knows it. Okay. So, so Satan appealing. Now, he, he was the lust of the flesh. Now he's appealing to the lust of the eyes. He says, show him something. Show him something. Put on a big show. Don't we like to do that? If we, if, we put a, if we put a big enough show together, we'll get enough people and maybe somebody will get saved. You know. You know, when I find out, we have, we, have, we have created an entertainment mentality. The, the body of Christ, I believe, has, has created like a generation gap entertainment mentality. We expect to attract kids by having big shows. And again, I, I got nothing wrong with you know, concerts and stuff, we, you know, we go, we've been to them, and it's nice to go and relax and worship God. That's great. But we think that if, if we're going to get people in the church, we've got to have, we have the big show. We've got to have the big entertainment. We've got to have the light show. You know, uh, you know, let's get strobe lights. You know, we want strobe lights and the smoke machines and stuff. One guy one time wanted to come here and burn incense. You know, I mean, I mean we, if we have the, you know, make the right atmosphere and make it uh, an attraction, you know, and get the, get, we'll, get a, we'll get a name band in, you know, and, man, I'll bring them in. Well, you know, they might bring them in, but then they just go back out. You know. Go ahead, Jesus. Jump off, jump off the wall of the temple. You fly around a little bit. Herod, remember, uh, Herod wanted him to do a trick when he was, when he was uh, taken by taking the pilot. And uh, Pilate sent him over to Herod. And Herod said, I heard about you. Do something. He wanted him to do a little, you know, a little magic act. And Jesus didn't do anything. Because he wouldn't have done any good. This is the lust of the eyes. Do something that will appeal to what we see. Something that looks, looks might. Finally, he says, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Remember a couple weeks ago, Sunday morning, we were talking about the Tower of Babel? I tell you what, man can build some pretty glorious places. Now I guess there's, there's a competition between nations of who can have the tallest building. <laughs> I think the tallest one now is in like Dubai. And it's like a big tall building. And that's, that's a, man, we want, we, we want these magnificent buildings. Or else if you go, now I've never been to Las Vegas, okay, but I've seen pictures. They build these big, ma magnificent, you know, things. And, ah, and it's really, wow, kingdoms of the world. Right? Satan said, look, look at all the glory of what man has done. And if he said back, back 2,000 years ago, just imagine today. I mean, we've gotten pretty good at it in 2,000 years. Building stuff. Of course, it only take one airplane to bring it down, but, you know, it's, I mean, it's, you look at these skyscrapers, wow, look up. And Satan said, see, I, I really believe that Satan believes he can still get over on this. He said to Jesus, all these things I'll give to you. All you got to do is fall down and worship. He says the same thing to us. He says, I'll give you anything you want. Sell enough crack, you can go buy a Hummer. You know? Just don't get caught. <laughs> you know, you, I'll give you anything. If you, if you bow down and worship me, I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what Bobby, just, just worship me. I've said this so many times, you've heard me say it. In the Roman Empire, they didn't care if you could have any religion you wanted to as long as you worship the emperor. As long as once a year you had to go bow down to a statue of the emperor and worship him as God, then you can go do whatever you want to. And that's the way we are now. Go do what you want to do. I mean, have whatever religion you want. Just bow down to the emperor. You know, that's why some of you may have heard lately now, you know, when they, they came out with this Obamacare stuff, uh, they're making, they're, every, every corporation has to provide abortion services in their, in their uh, health care. So what's this one? Hobby Lobby, right? They're one of many. They're a Christian-owned organization. They said, we don't, want to, we don't want to provide that. Well, the government's saying, too bad. Go ahead, worship whatever God you want to, but you've got to bow down to us. 
Now, it's going to go to the courts, and it's going to do whatever it's going to be, you know. But, but that's, that's the way the world is. The world wants to demand us to worship it. Satan wants to demand our worship. You go ahead and go whatever church you want to go to. Go sing whatever song you want to sing. Go ahead and uh, do whatever, you know, read whatever Bible you want to read. Just worship me, and hey, man, it's all yours. And sad to say, there's a lot of churches bought into that. There's probably a lot of church of God bought into that. Jesus didn't buy into it. Thank the Lord Jesus. Can you just imagine asking God to worship you? But how much of what we do, we expect God to bow down and worship us. How, how much of what we do, we expect God to do our bidding instead of us doing his bidding? See, it's very subtle. See, Satan wasn't very subtle with Jesus. But he's subtle with us. When we start to expect God to honor our desires instead of wanting to honor his, we're bowing down and worshiping Satan. You ever, ever read, there's a, uh, there's, there's a, 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 a series out of, of uh, DVDs called, I really want to get, it's called, They Sold Their Soul for Rock and Roll. Anybody ever hear that? <laughs> and, and what this guy says was, at the beginning of, and, and now listen, I was a rocker from way back, okay? I still rock a little bit. But listen, all the way back to a guy named Aleister Crowley. Have you ever heard that name, Aleister Crowley? He was like, he fashioned himself to be an antichrist. I mean, he called himself an antichrist. He, his motto was, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> do whatever you want to do. Just go ahead and do it. What's our, what's our culture and society right now? What? Just go ahead and do what you want to do. There's no God that tells you something's right or wrong. Just do what you want to do. I listened to a lot of that music. <laughs> I did. I know, what, I know what that's about. I'm, not, I'm getting off the track. Satan said to Jesus, fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. It's funny because we always say, get thee behind me, Satan. Brother Albert says, I don't want him behind me. I want him gone. Anyway, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, what? Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Same temptations that face us every day is encapsulated right here in, this, in these few verses. And the question I have the question I have to ask myself, and I look at myself, and you know, there's some days that I miss it. I know about anybody else. There's some days that when, when I lay down at night to go to sleep, I think back on my day, and I say, well, Lord, you're going to have to forgive me for that one. I confess that one. I repent. Anybody know, anybody know what I'm talking about? So I, try to keep, I try to keep an account every night. I don't try to let it go more than one night because I'll forget about it. But these, these, what we're seeing here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and this last one, what? The pride of life. Proud. Just worship me and I'll give you everything you want. And the thing is, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. We have relinquished our dominion to him. Adam did when he sinned. So he wasn't really lying when he said all those kingdoms belong to him. They worshiped him. Kingdoms of the world worship. I don't, I don't know of any kingdoms that worship God in this world. Jesus said, it is written that you shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil leaves him and angels came and ministered. Unto him. Jesus began his ministry not marching into Jerusalem, not putting on, you know, not healing people, not having a healing line, not 
But he began, he began his ministry one-on-one with Satan in his face. And he proved that he could defeat the enemy. Not by, I mean, he could snap his fingers and turn them into dust if he wanted to. But instead, he spoke God's word. And in the, in the point of his ultimate weakness, the word of God was enough to send Satan packing. He didn't, take, he didn't pick a fist fight with him. He just used God's word. I believe he did that so he could show us. If we want to live for God, if we want to follow him, if we want to be kingdom people, it, it, it's not, you know, a great faith we have, powerful. I'm so, I'm, I hear some of these people and I want to throw a brick at this TV screen. Because they talk like, you know what, without the word of God, you're, you ain't nothing. You ain't nothing. We're all, we're all humans in need of God's word. We, we won't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. We won't tempt the Lord our God. And we won't worship Satan. We learn these things. That, that word tempt, when it said Jesus was tempted, it's, it's the same thing when, when they take gold and they test it to see how pure it is. Before Jesus could go out and begin to preach and teach and heal, he had to be tested And he came forth like pure gold. That's what Peter said. He said, don't think it's strange the fiery trial that's going to come your way. Because you're just going to be tested. You're going to come forth as pure gold. You know, I think it's in 1 Peter, and maybe we'll just close reading that passage. 1 Peter chapter, chapter 1, I believe. I hope that's right. And, and uh, uh, look, starting with verse 3. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, I'm going to read quickly here, hath begotten us again unto a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, this is ours, this is what we're looking forward to, and undefiled, and that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power, say, I'm kept. I'm a kept man, all right? Who are kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through what? Manyfold what? Temptations. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life. Satan coming at you every day. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, may be found what? Under honor, uh, under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, all the things that we go through as believers, it's all for the purpose of preparing us to give glory to God. We might learn how to resist the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It comes every day. It comes every day. Some folks, I, I mentioned this before, when we were at the uh, Glow meeting on uh, last Thursday, a lady stood up and told about a terrible ordeal she had been through. This lady was an older lady. She'd been a, she'd been a believer for a long time. She's a minister in, in her church. But she'd been through a terrible ordeal. And, you know, when, when you hear things like that and see things like that, you think, man, that's a, that's a woman of God. She'd been, she'd been serving the Lord. She'd been faithful. She'd been righteous. And she's going through this. And a lot of people say, why do they go through it? It's because the trying of our faith makes us a lot more like Jesus Christ every time. And just like Jesus was tested, so we're tested. We're tempted. But when we learn how to use God's word, even in our weakest place, 
Couldn't get much more weaker than not having eaten for 40 days. In our weakest place, that word comes forth. And I want to encourage you tonight as we close, and we'll pick up there next week where we left off. I was going to do a little bit more, but we'll wait. We'll wait till next week. I'm going to go on too long. I want to encourage you tonight, spending just an hour together this evening looking at God's word. When the tempter comes, and he will come, your adversary will come. If he doesn't come, he'll send, some, he'll send one of his underlings. You better get that word of God where you can get it. You can pull it out. You know, these words that we repeat over and over again, we know that all things work together for good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. There's a reason why we repeat that so much. Because it's the truth. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's, there's a reason for repeating that, because Satan will come and condemn you. Greater is he who's in me than he who is in the world. There's a reason why that's such a great scripture and we quote all the time, because sometimes Satan appears bigger than anything you can imagine. I thank God that my Lord didn't come as a superman, but he came. And the Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tested and he came forth like pure gold. And you'll come forth like pure gold. When your testing comes, if your faith and trust is in Jesus Christ, if you're a child of God, you may waver, you may be shaken a little bit, maybe, maybe, maybe your knees are shaking a little bit, but that rock you're standing on will never be shaken. And every time you go through, God lets you know that he's there. Every time, and we've, I know many of you have been through, have been through dark times and been through the valley of the shadow of death. But God has said, he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what Jesus said. He said, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. That's what we've got to stand on. Jesus went there. He's not going to ask you to go any place he hasn't been. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord.